Welcome back to another episode of the Cody Tucker Show. As always, I'm your host, Cody Tucker. So, uh, I am, look, I am not operating on uh, (laughs) my uh, full speed right now. Jesus Christ. So, I, I guess in my head, I was thinking, hey, like, you're doing pretty good right now. You don't seem to hate yourself as much as normal. Uh, let's change that. <laughs> and so I took a little trip to McDonald's, and it is fucking me up so bad. I So, like, whenever I go to McDonald's, I get the same thing every time. Two McDoubles, no pickles or onion, add Big Mac sauce, large order of fries. I go to McDonald's, immediately I'm waiting in a drive through line that has about, I don't know, 15 cars in it. So I know I'm going to be here a while. And, which has given me plenty of time to contemplate, you know, is this where I want to be in my life? (laughs) And in all that time of, you know, self-reflection, somehow still managed to place the order, sit through the line. And look, I go to what I think is the best McDonald's in my city, which is not saying much (laughs) like like the the number one mcdonald's in your area is still just a giant shit box so i go order this fucking food and i don't know if all mcdonald's do this do this if all mcdonald's does this mcdonald's plural who fuck I don't know if all McDonald's do this. Yeah, that's right. I don't, so I don't know if they all do this or if it's just the fucking horrible ones where I'm at. But I place what I think is a decently simple order. Two fucking... I mean, they should be having McDoubles on standby 24-7. And granted, yeah, I'm taking the fucking nasty-ass pickles and onions out and adding some Mac sauce, which can't take more than you know, I would say 30 seconds to do, but apparently for these fucking bastards, it is like, I'm asking them to split the fucking atom. So they immediately are like, Oh, we need you to go wait and, you know, pull off into the side to wait for this. I'm like, what the fuck are you talking about? Like this, like y'all should have this already in the bag. By the time I get to window number two, I mean, my God, so I go pull off, wait, it, over 15 minutes for the shit to come out. The lady comes out, rolled down my window, and she's holding a McFrappe, uh, whatever that coffee bullshit is. And I immediately just look at her and go, that ain't mine. And she's like, oh, okay, and just walks off. I'm like, what the fuck is going on? Look, I I don't go to McDonald's expecting a bunch of fucking Harvard graduates <laughs> to be making my shit, but it can't be that goddamn difficult. So I wait another 15 minutes. She comes back out to ask me, what did you order? <laughs> like, holy fuck, lady. Like, so I tell her, goes back, comes back out another 15 minutes later. So... If my math is mathing, that's like 45 minutes sitting in this fucking parking lot. Again, another... So I'm there almost for about an hour. Uh, which really, the you know, I'm getting what I deserve, you know, for waiting in, you know, in that line that long, waiting for that... I mean, I deserved what came to me. But I get my shit and immediately open it up. And, you know, start tearing into it. And 
like god i swear to god it's like they take you know and i'm not expecting the fucking burgers to look the way it looks on the pictures like i'm not that much of a jackass but it, i swear to god it looks like they just took like both halves slammed them up against the wall waited for them to slide down and then picked it back up and put them together and then he <laughs> wrapped the fucker and gave it to me like or somebody was just in there just fucking smoking these things and like i don't know if i'm i mean maybe i am just maybe i'm just a bitch and expect too much but it was so fucking gross and that's why like i don't know what it is about mcdonald's but i know it's disgusting and i know it tastes fucking terrible but every couple months i just like have to go to mcdonald's and what it has done to me in the past two days is disturbing (laughs) like i mean i am i have the mixed shits so bad right now like I am this close from Mick rupturing my Mick colon, <laughs> like having a fucking Mick prolapse. I like the shits that I have taken in the past 48 hours. Like I damn near like shit session. Number one, I damn near had to like call up the city and tell them like, Hey, <laughs> the East side of town is about to experience something it has never experienced before. This is not a drill. (laughs) Like, y'all need to call in fuckers from, you know, across the state to come help you out with this, uh, (laughs) with, with this blockage that's about to happen. Like, my fucking bathroom basically turned into Chernobyl, uh, over the past two days. And, man, is it, oh, is it, bad i mean it's still bad it has not gone away like i i don't know how much like poundage of food two mcdoubles and a large order of fries which by the way because of my weight and or not my like like my weight like how long i waited <laughs> they the lady came back and she was like hey by the way i gave you an extra order of large fries like sorry about the weight and i was like oh shit thank you and this piece of shit knew better <laughs> like she should know, uh, like, you can't give me that. I'm going to eat all of it, and I did. I ate two large orders of fries, which, oh, no. It, that, I mean, like, I'm still dehydrated. <laughs> like, I felt like I was crawling through the fucking Sahara Desert. Just, oh, my God. It, it was a, it is, a, it, it is still a nightmare. An ongoing just shit show. And, like, I mean, I don't know why I do this to myself. Like, I know better. I'm not, like, I'm not a stupid person. I I do stupid things and say stupid shit sometimes. But deep down, I know I'm not a complete idiot. Yet, I make these types of decisions on a regular basis. Man, it is, it's so bad. Like, I am raw. (laughs) Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I'm going to try to get through this without having to, you know, blast the back of my britches, but we'll see. So, let's just go ahead and move right on to uh, what's going on in the world. So, this, this really, there's nothing really that interesting about this. It's Tom Brady reveals his 15-year-old son, Jack, is nearly as tall as him now. The only reason I'm mentioning this is because typically when Tom Brady takes a picture with his kid, uh, they're facing the other way, (laughs) but still this close. (laughs) The Tom Brady making out with his kids, his dad, Belichick, is odd. Like, I, I won't even give my dad a handshake. Like, let alone kiss that fucker right on the mouth. Oh, my God. Get a fucking taste of Paul Malls and Jim Beam. Yeah, no fucking thanks. So, I mean, again, just mentioning it for shits and gigs. But uh, let's move on to something else. So, okay. So, this is... uh, How I am alive right now is... 
just a very it's a staggering um, question that I think will never truly be answered. But this came out where it was showing how, like what was all in the original Four Locos. So one can of the original Four Loco was supposedly the equivalent of four to six beers. So let's say five beers, one espresso shot, and one Red Bull. <laughs> Dude, I used to drink these like two at a time, just chugging them. My heart should be like my heart should have just fucking exploded in my chest. <laughs> like me at 17, 18 versus me at damn near 30 are two drastically different people. Like I can't drink regular coffee. Like I have to drink even if I drink decaf coffee. I still feel like I'm going to have a heart attack. I used to fucking basically shotgun these things. Like, I remember, so I used to work at a movie theater, um, which, you know, is a sentence that (laughs) pretty soon people will never be uttering that sentence again, unfortunately. But um, so I used to work at a movie theater when I worked there. Uh, we, you know, do midnight premieres for like Harry Potter, Hunger Games, um, Twilight, like shit like that. And it was tradition amongst us employees that during the midnight premieres, like the little gap of time we had in between the regular day stuff and then the start of the midnight premiere, there's about an hour and a half to kind of just bullshit get ready for the onslaught of fucking 15 year old, (laughs) 15 year old girls, um, coming to see twilight. And it was a, it was a complete shit show. So we started basically a tradition of one of the people going and just buying a shitload of watermelon four locos or like, I think the green apple ones too. I always went with watermelon, but would buy the watermelon four locos, And we would go out back by the dumpster and just down, just fucking chug these things uh, and, you know, try to make it through this fucking midnight premiere bullshit. And I remember there was one time where uh, the person who would supply said four locos had to go get them like early in the day. And this is like middle of summer, probably like July, I would say. Um, And so had all these cans of four locos sitting in his car in the parking lot for a solid 10 hours. (laughs) So these fuckers were warm. And I mean, the only thing more disgusting than a four loco is a hot four loco. And we just sat there and just, I mean, just took them down. And I drank two of them back to back. So, if this is legit, which it seems to be, that means that in a span of, I would say, 15 minutes, maybe less than that, because I was, like, chugging these things. So, we'll we'll just say 15 minutes. So, in a span of 15 minutes, I consumed 10 beers, 2 shots of espresso, and 2 Red Bulls. (laughs) Oh, man. And, uh, oh, I felt it. I definitely felt like I had just taken all that in. Like I was walking up and down these hallways. Like I felt like I was like, you know, when you're walking on a, um, like at airports, they have those like basically like flat treadmills kind of, I don't even know what they're called, but it's like the little walk path, like where you could like fast walk. That's how I felt like I was walking up and down this movie theater, just sweating my balls off. Just, I mean, had to have been minutes away from a heart attack. Make it through this midnight premiere bullshit. And other tradition, after midnight premieres, we'd all meet up at IHOP and whatever. Just shoot the shit until like four in the morning. Call it a night. I got done with my shit a little early, so I went and sat in my car waiting for everybody else to leave. At some point, I fell asleep. So I'm in the car, in my car, in the parking lot of the movie theater, waiting for everybody else to be done. I fall asleep. When I wake up, I am now in the parking lot of IHOP. 
<laughs> and do not know how I got there. Um, it, I mean, I'm not saying that I'm like proud of any of this. It's just one of those things that you look back and say, how am I alive? The fact that I'm here and other people are not is, well, one, uh, a, a fucking Christmas miracle, but also some sort of cruel joke because <laughs> I shouldn't be here. The, I mean, oh boy. So, yeah, I mean, people nowadays will never know what the fuck this world was like. I mean, taking down these four locos and just trying to, like, keep your shit straight. Like, now, I mean, I think four locos are still around. Um, I think. I think they, like, just dropped all the shit <laughs> and then brought them back out. Um, either way, I mean, it is bananas. So... <coughs> <coughs> Sorry, semen. Um, all right, next. Oh, God. So, I have not seen Fast X yet. I do plan on seeing it. Um, but this came out, so the the movie did not do so well. <laughs> and Vin Diesel is upset with Jason Momoa's overacting in Fast X, blaming the co-star for the bad reviews. Look, let me tell you something, Vin Diesel. <laughs> I don't know if maybe you didn't read <laughs> the reviews of Fasts 1 through 9. Um, they're not very good. <laughs> like, I mean, it, <laughs> nobody was, like, saying that you got robbed for an Oscar, uh, you know, for Fast 6. Like, these movies suck. It's the point. The point of these movies is that they are complete dog shit, but you go watch them because it's like, you know, it's like, um, it's like an arcade machine, like an arcade, like when you walk into an arcade, the sensory overload where you're just like, oh, lights and sounds and shit. That's Fast and the Furious. Jason Momoa didn't ruin this shit. <laughs> this shit was ruined from, uh, I would say the second one. First one actually is pretty good. Um, but two through 10 and that Hobbs Shaw bullshit. Yeah. I mean, you weren't getting like rave reviews by fucking Roger Ebert and Peter Travers. <laughs> like, come on, man. God, Vin Diesel looks like a fucking bloated nutsack now. Poor bastard. He definitely has a complex because he started all this shit with uh, Dwayne Johnson and now it's starting shit with Jason Momoa. I think anyone who is like taller, stronger, and better looking, he just thinks is like he's going to start shit with them. <laughs> like he looks like like Vin Diesel kind of looks like if like if Pitbull had a thyroid issue, like some sort of glandular, you know, disorder. That's Vin Diesel now. Boy, oh boy. Poor bastard. I mean, you know, whatever. Make your money, but Jesus Christ. All right. Oh, my God. So, um, Mark Zuckerberg has officially accepted the challenge to cage fight Elon Musk, and I am rock hard. <laughs> this is going to be amazing. I've already, I mean, I will take anyone's bet right now. My money is on... As much as I like Elon Musk, my money's on fucking Zuck Dog. That dude is going to wipe the floor with that South African bastard. Like, there is no way. Mark Zuckerberg is not a human being. Elon Musk is just, you know, your run-of-the-mill dweeb who got hair transplants, wears nice clothes, and now, you know, is cool. Mark Zuckerberg has never been cool, will never be cool, is not a human being. Um, he is going to... When you don't have emotions, you don't feel tired, you win. That's the <laughs> that's the fighter's way. Void of emotion. The st I mean, he's a machine. It's There's no chance. Like... There is a, I would say, a 90% chance 
that Mark Zuckerberg starts flying during this fight. Like, actually levitates. <laughs> I mean, grows another pair of arms. I mean, it's it's going to... It's going to be a fucking bloodbath. And I cannot wait. Whatever the amount is that I have to pay to watch this, I'm fucking... Money's yours. Oh, my God. I have... Man... I haven't been this fucking revved up in a minute. Oh, boy. All right. Shit, probably since the fappening. Um, next one. Okay. I have a feeling that along the lines of the... Um, I mean, which has kind of become a trend in the old uh, shit show here. But the um, kind of food... I guess you call it a debate. Um... Boy, I have been getting drugged through the ringer for opinions that I think are pretty fucking normal. Like, I eat corn on the cob, a, I think, in normal way, long ways. Um, I don't like bacon to be black, and I don't want it to be fucking raw. Which, apparently, there is no such thing as raw bacon, which I'm just founding, finding out about. Uh, I don't know. I Have I been getting... I must have been getting lied to my entire life, which is fucking possible. Um, but this one, I have a feeling it's just, this might be the end of me. So it's favorite pop tarts flavors. I hate fruit flavoring so fucking much. So immediately knock off frosted strawberry, frosted blueberry, frosted cherry, frosted raspberry, frosted grape, frosted wild berry, which what the fuck is a wild berry? Um, so immediately knock off all the fruit flavor ones. It tastes like somebody like fruit the the especially the strawberry, which I guess is kind of like the classic. The two classics the thing are the strawberry and the blueberry. They both taste like if those fruits jizzed. Like that that blueberry and strawberry flavoring is not coming from a fruit. <laughs> I mean if it is, it is literally coming from a fruit. Um I go Without a doubt, uh, s'mores, cookies and cream, hot fudge sundae. I mean, I'm going for the ones. However, I can get diabetes the fastest. <laughs> Give me that. And that hot fudge sundae one, holy shit. You take one bite out of that and your teeth start fucking shaking. Like, it is. I mean, that hot fudge sundae has to be like a thousand calories a piece. <laughs> I don't give a shit. I will eat a box. It says eight. Well, there's eight in a box. Is that normal? I felt like there was more. Well, there's two in a pack, so four. I guess that's it. I mean, I'll tear. I'll take down an entire box of Pop Tarts. One thing I have never done, which this is where I'm going to get destroyed, and I'm okay with it because I know that it's fucking crazy. I have never in my life toasted a Pop Tart, ever, never. Never have toasted a pop tart, always microwaved, um, which I know is <laughs> kind of insane. It's always either microwave or just eat it fucking raw. <laughs> but I mean, and I did not. If this peanut butter one is real, if there really is a peanut butter pop tart, oh my god! Like I'm gonna fucking shove one up my ass. I shouldn't have said that. Oh well. But, uh, yeah, so whatever your f fucking favorite one is, leave a comment. Say, oh, I like the strawberry one, you son of a bitch. Like, you fat fuck. Of course, you just like the fucking chocolatey ones. Well, yeah, I do, bitch, because the fruit flavor ones are disgusting. And also, fuck the brown sugar cinnamon one. And that, that frosted chocolate chip, way too much uh, just b b fucking cardboard-ass bread. Like that, it has to be completely frosted. You can't just put a little fucking shit drizzle on there. So, yeah. Um, this will be the last one before we go into like something uh, interesting, I suppose, or the uh, interesting little stories. Um, so, according to the Wall Street Journal, a reputable source, San Francisco's once thriving hotel market is suffering its worst stretch in at least 15 years, pummeled by the same forces that have emptied out the city's office towers and closed many retail stores. 
that is half the that should be half the headline. It should say dot 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 because of a massive amount of bum shit. <laughs> San Francisco is the most disgusting second most disgusting place on the globe behind New Orleans of course. The amount of homeless shit like there are apps that tell you how many dumps have been taken publicly along the San Franciscan streets. Hate Ashbury used to be filled with dirty hippies is now filled with just nasty fucking feces caked bums. Like it is a like no shit nobody wants to stay in a hotel in San Francisco when every time you walk out <laughs> you you have to like basically put on a pair of fucking waders <laughs> to make it through the four feet of just hobo f- fucking dumps. Disgusting. You couldn't fucking get me to stay a night in that city. Fuck no. I'm not saying where I live is perfect either. Trust me. I I don't know the stats, but... <laughs> I think there is we where I live is probably there are probably more meth addicts per capita than anywhere in the country. So yeah, I get it. But I would much rather have to like walk across, you know, use needles <laughs> and uh glass pipes than giant <laughs> you know, giant fucking smelly cinnamon rolls that are being left everywhere. <laughs> So, enough of all that business. That's, that's enough. You've heard it. All you need to hear on that. So let's go through some interesting stories. Um, so, this one um, will be a little apropos. Um, you know, what's going on in the world today with the Ocean Gate gate. <laughs> Man, those poor bastards. Um, so, everyone knows the story of the Titanic. Leonardo DiCaprio freezes to death. Kate Winslet shoves a diamond up her ass, chisels him off the door, and uh, lives a happy life, you know, until she's old and, you know, brittle and tries to bang Bill Paxton. Um, So everybody knows Titanic story. One aspect of Titanic story may not be super familiar with is the name Morgan Robertson. So I'm sure, in all the Titanic lore, you probably do not know the name Morgan Robertson. Morgan Robertson was an author who wrote a book called The Wreck of the Titan. So the book, The Wreck of the Titan, written by um, Morgan Robertson, is a book about the largest passenger ship in the world setting sail through the North Atlantic. And as it set sails through the North Atlantic, it is hit by an iceberg. It is hit by an iceberg, sinks. There are nowhere near enough life jackets on board, so pretty much everybody dies. That story sounds an awful lot like the Titanic. The name of the ship in the fucking book is the Titan. So you think, oh, well this fucker just made like a fictionalized version of the actual Titanic, which sunk in 1912. He comes out a little bit later, writes his book. No. Morgan Robertson's book came out in 1898. 14 years before there ever was a Titanic. 14 years before a boat, the largest passenger ship of the world, set sail across the North Atlantic, hit an iceberg, sinks. He wrote a book about the Titan that also... Set sail across the North Atlantic, hit an iceberg, and sank. 14 years before, Morgan Robertson was a goddamn time traveler. Um, so that's one. It's a pretty short one, but I just think it's pretty fascinating. goes along with, uh, you know, all the bullshit with the, uh, you know, pay $250,000 and you can get fucking, <laughs> you can get smushed at the bottom of the ocean. You couldn't fucking pay me enough. To get on that ship. That little fucking sardine can. That you're about to take. Down to the bottom of the ocean. To see. 
what a bun- a big old hunk of fucking rusted metal. That's what you're seeing, really. Like all the goods from the Titanic's basically been scooped out and is in like James Cameron's fucking game room. Um, I mean, these motherfuckers pay two a quarter of a million dollars to get put into something smaller than a minivan, controlled by what looked like a, f- a fucking GameCube controller, and sink down to the bottom and fucking get crushed to death like that. I mean, it was 6,000 pounds of pressure, which I believe is the what I was reading. It's the equivalent amount of pressure of you being crushed by the Eiffel Tower. So, I mean, whatever. Fuck all of that. The ocean is a scary place, and we don't belong there. If we belonged in the ocean, we would have fucking flippers and gills. But we don't, so this is where we're supposed to be. Um, so next one is, well, not a very pleasant story, <laughs> to be quite honest, um, is the story of another very forgetful president along the lines of, you know, there's a pretty big chunk in American history where nobody knew, knows shit about it. Like, no one knows who any of these presidents are. This one involves the president, Grover Cleveland, who might be, you know, taking, you know, modern accounts into consideration. Grover Cleveland might be the most piece of, like, let me rephrase this. Grover Cleveland might be the biggest piece of shit that we've ever had as the leader of this country. Grover, (laughs) old Grover was at one point, I believe, mayor of Buffalo, New York, I think. Uh, I know he became governor of New York before he was president. When he was, so before he ran for president, um, in 1873, he met this woman named Maria Halpin. Maria Halpin was this, you know, somewhat younger woman who, or actually I think, I believe she was 38. Yes, so Maria Halpin, Maria Halpin's this thirty-eight-year-old woman that Grover Cleveland, you know, meets, kind of has a thing for, and he basically pesters her like nonstop to like go out with him. Like, will you please go out with me? Go out with me? Go out with me? And eventually, Maria Halpin agrees to go out on a date with Grover Cleveland, who again, not president yet, but will be president pretty soon. Um, she agrees to go on the date. They have what she says and Grover Cleveland says pretty nice time. He walks her home to her apartment and really wants to come in. He's like, Hey bitch, I just spent a dollar 50 on dinner, whatever fucking dinner costs back in the 1800s. He's like, I deserve a little, you know, something for this. Uh, she does not, uh, agree with this. Maria Halpin does not want him coming into her apartment. It's like, yeah, no, nah, I don't really like you like that. I just kind of, I was hungry. <laughs> Grover Cleveland is um, not taking no for an answer and proceeds to force his way into the apartment and do things to Maria Halpin, which are highly illegal and just real fucking bad. <laughs> I mean, I can't say the word because... If you say the word on any form of social media, you are fucking blacklisted. But it rhymes with uh, shape. So he does, he does that to Maria Halpin and leaves. And that's the end of the story. But not really, because six weeks later, Maria Halpin is fucking pregnant and knows that it is Grover Cleveland's kid. Grover Cleveland says, uh, bullshit. You're fucking a bunch of different people. It could be any of their kids. Um, that became the narrative for a long time was that Maria Halpin was basically a whore, which is the narrative that usually gets spun amongst women who, you know, accuse people of shape. Um, and it's bullshit. Maria Halpin was not, uh, you know, doing any of that so Maria Halpin um you know accuses him there's all these issues with it where 
I mean, obviously, just nobody believes her. I mean, you know, people hardly believe people now, let alone in the 1870s. So she ends up having the kid is like, no, this is yours. Grover Cleveland pays child support for this kid. Although the kid isn't his. So, you know, riddle me that. But as he's getting more influential into politics, Grover Cleveland is like, ooh, this woman could be a problem. Grover Cleveland has the child taken away from her and put into an orphanage and has her put into a mental institution, an insane asylum, saying that she's like a belligerent alcoholic, uh, you know, not suitable to take care of a small child, which is ridiculous. Um, she ends up in the asylum just for a little bit um, because the doctor realizes like, Like, even publicly say, like, there is nothing wrong. There's nothing unstable about this woman. This is basically a crime of power. Um, So, yeah. So, they agree that this is all complete BS. So, Maria Halpern gets released. And she's, like, going to go public about this. Like, you know, you... Like, this is ridiculous. So, Grover Cleveland ends up running for president in 1884. And that's whenever, you know, she kind of starts to go public with everything. Um, Nobody, again, nobody believes her. So Grover Cleveland ends up, you know. So in 1882, Grover Cleveland is the governor of New York. 1884, run for president. Um, He's kind of wanting this to, like, die down. So he's like, oh, I need to marry someone, you know, have a first lady. Let let this go. So the... (laughs) The second scumbaggy thing about Grover Cleveland is that his first lady was a woman named Frances Folsom. Frances Folsom is 27 years younger than Grover Cleveland. Frances Folsom is the daughter of Grover Cleveland's former best friend who had recently died. The child that Grover Cleveland has with Maria Halpin is named after... Francis Folsom's dad, a.k.a. Grover Cleveland's former best friend. Yeah. (laughs) Grover Cleveland knew this woman from the time that she was an infant. Actually, before she was born, gave to Francis Folsom's parents a baby carriage as a pregnancy gift. Uh, And then 27 years later, or... Well, not necessarily 27 years later. She's 27 years younger. Whatever. Later, marries this woman and makes her his first lady. And, yeah. Then that's it. Grover Cleveland becomes president. Uh, two non- or non-consecutive terms. Two non-consecutive terms, which has still never happened. Um, <laughs> unless old Trump dog can say something about it. Um, but, yeah. So, their story of Grover Cleveland. Wild. Last one is, boy, um, this is a rough one. <laughs> this one had me kind of uh, hook. So it's about a fellow, again, probably a name you don't know, named Douglas Mawson. Douglas Mawson was a fellow who, from Australia, wanted to kind of explore Antarctica, which had basically just recently been... Um, you know, had recently had any sort of explorations done on the continent. So Douglas Mawson is like, well, yeah, I need to get down there. Um, I'm Australian. I'm crazy. <laughs> I should have no problem <laughs> trekking across uh, Antarctica. So he goes with two other fellows uh, on this expedition. There's like a base camp because, again, people have already been there. Um, there's a base camp. And then they, they're there at the base camp with, like, you know, teams of, like, sled dogs. And they're going to use these, the three guys, Douglas Moss and his two buds, are going to use these sled dogs to go about 300 miles uh, worth of traveling across the Antarctic continent. At a time of year where winds were averaging about 100 miles an hour, topping at 200 miles an hour, and the temperature was around 70 degrees below freezing. And this is in 1913. 
when you basically were wearing like a wool sweater <laughs> and that's it. So they decide to trek across Antarctica together and it is a disaster. So Douglas Mawson, his two friends start going um, pretty early on into the uh, trek. One of the guys falls into a crevasse 150 feet down, dead. Douglas Mawson like crawls on his stomach to look over the hole and sees a couple dogs and his friend just dead. And he's like, okay, uh, one down, two to go. So then they keep going a little bit further. Um, they choose to, they're like, look, he went down with a sled, a couple dogs. We probably don't have enough uh, provisions. We need to either decide, like, all right, we're going to keep going and push through and hope for the best, or we turn back around and head back. They decide on the second option. They're like, all right, like, cut our losses. Like, let's just go back. So they start to go back. It pretty soon start running out of food which leaves a couple of dogs and they start making dog soup and kind of living off of that the way for the trek. This trek is like a couple months. This isn't like, oh, we're going to go on a hike for a day or two. Like this is a couple months just trekking through just ice and snow with 100 mile per hour winds, 70 degrees below freezing. Um, like a warm day for them is like minus 20 so yeah <laughs> cold and so they end up having to eat some of the dogs which boy does not sound very appetizing um and his friend so douglas mawson's other friend guy number two ends up just completely going just going insane getting completely delirious and ends up basically just crapping himself to death um, from like a mixture of just bad nutrition um, stress I mean all these things put together and basically just has unstoppable diarrhea to the point where he just dies like literally craps himself to death so now we it's just Douglas Mawson and a couple of dogs that's it and they still got um about a hundred miles left to go <laughs> to, to get back to base camp. Um, so Douglas Mawson is under the impression that he is probably going to die in just a random vacant spot in Antarctica and starts trekking and, you know, the mixture of like having basically no food um, combined with the crazy wind and cold, his lips start just cracking open um, his nose stopped producing mucus and just became like basically a frostbitten nose. He had frostbite on like his fingertips. Um, and then his like feet started hurting really bad. And at one point during the expedition, he stops to take off his boot because he's like, geez, my foot is feeling real weird right now. Takes off his boot and according to him, when he pulls off the boot, he also pulls off the majority of his foot. <laughs> so skin, flesh, all that comes off in the boot. And he said there's basically just a soup of blood, skin, and a little bit of meat in his boot. And now just has kind of like a nub and can't walk anymore. So he basically ends up like dragging on his tummy across the rest of this way and is like I'm going to die does not die Douglas Mawson actually made it back to base camp so Douglas Mawson somehow doesn't die from all of this scoots his way another like it was like I think an almost another month or a couple, maybe a couple of weeks it was like another couple of weeks of him just inching along on his stomach all the way back to base camp and makes it back to base camp and lives. And yeah, Douglas Mawson might be the craziest human being to ever live. So 
you know, think about that when you're eating, uh, you know, tomato soup. <laughs> Eat a little tomato bisque and think of Douglas Mawson's boot. So, um, well, I think that'll do it for this one. Until next time, goodbye.